everybody. Um, my name is Edward Simpson and I'm the director of the SOAS South Asia Institute. Um, good afternoon, good morning or good evening, depending on where you are. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, who is Professor Vinita Doran from the University of Sussex. Uh, she is of modern South Asia and has written on numerous topics, but one that endures is the history of the natural world, natural heritage, and perhaps colonial constructions of, of nature as well, with a focus on the northeast of India, Bihar, and West Bengal. And today, the title of her talk is Climate Signals, Floods, Droughts, and Famine in South Asia from the 17th to the 19th century. And this is a seminar given in a series organized jointly between the SOAS South Asia Institute and the Center of Law, Environment and Development at SOAS. So we'll have the presentation which will last approximately 40, 45 minutes, and then we'll have a chaired question and answer session towards the end. Vinita, welcome. Thank you. Um, I'll just go straight to my slides and try and share the screen with you to start with. But thank you very much for inviting me. A real pleasure to be here. Um, i just start with my uh, first slide. So uh, uh, this is a very historical topic. Uh, so what I'll be looking at in this presentation, which feeds into, as I said, the larger topic on climate change and the green economy, is what does a history of a climate tell us about um, uh, the current um, problems associated with floods, droughts, famines, and cyclones? And many of you have added cyclones to the title recently because, of course, as we know, that on May 21st, uh, India and Calcutta was hit, in particular, Eastern India was hit by a level five uh, tropical cyclone, uh, uh, which exacted a great toll on on uh, buildings, on property, uh, and remarkably uh, much less on um, on human life, which is very different from uh, 19th century, the 1864 Calcutta cyclone, which I'll talk about in this presentation. So what are the sources, methods, and themes for a climate history of South Asia? And one of the things that I've been doing uh, along uh, with McGill and the UK Met Office is to create a climate archive uh, for South Asia, uh, so create a sort of climate series, a famine series, uh, a migration series. Uh, as you know, much of the data for South Asia is limited. You have much richer data for uh, Europe. Uh, and elsewhere, but the South Asian uh, data scene is, is quite limited. So one of the things we are doing as part of this project is to build up the climate archive uh, for South Asia. And the other thing that we uh, are, do uh, are doing is how do we build up this archive? So one of the things is using ship's logs, and we are quite linked to the UK Met Office called the ACRE project. Uh, we are also using uh, pre-colonial uh, manuscripts in the form of, uh, as part of our documentary sources. And we are looking at collecting and have collected a lot of both quantitative and qualitative data uh, from colonial records. And what do I mean by quantitative da data? This is uh, daily, sub-daily pressure uh, and temperature data uh, collected, for example, on ships, collected at botanic gardens. And we also looked at using qualitative data, including uh, ethnography. And as we know, the colonial data collection was extremely rich, a veritable doomsday book of data collecting. We've also tried to collect paleo sources uh, in order to understand, for example, how does the natural archive, for example, the Speleothem record, uh, complement the documentary archive for extreme events, uh, for example, such as droughts um, and floods. Um, more recently, climate history is becoming particularly fashionable. Um, they, of course, in the, in the past, the Annal School, uh, Loy Raduri in the 60s wrote about climate, but more recently, Jeffrey Parker, David Klingsmith, Richard Grove, and John of Richards have uh, really talked about climate and it's important for uh, history. So bringing nature back into history, removing the unnatural nature of history. And this is not to be a climate determinist or an environmental determinist, but to give nature and climate its due place 
uh, in our historical understanding. So the methods that we use for a climate history uh, is a very interdisciplinary. Um, it has to be a collaborative project, and in this case it is between historians, climatologists, paleoecologists, and anthropologists, so you can name them. Uh, but certainly it has to have a, a very strong interdisciplinary element. So what I'll be talking about today is the 17th century crisis in the context of India and how do we equate the uh, climate archive with Mughal Empire sources to understand what exactly is happening. We'll be looking at the 18th century on flood droughts and famine causation. And then briefly, we'll be looking at uh, 19th century cyclones. And we'll be trying to understand uh, what this, uh, understanding this history has for uh, 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 understanding adaptation and resilience uh, for climate uh, related events uh, for today, for example. So the key books I was uh, interested in and I referred to as secondary sources is Laduri's uh, great work, which is 1967, Times of Feast, Times of Famine. The history of climate since the year 1000. And of course, more recently in 2017, I don't know whether many of you have looked at this, Global Crisis, War, Climate Change, and Catastrophe in the 17th century, where Jeffrey Parker equates everything to the uh, Little Ice Age in terms of this period of crisis. And uh, we'll come to that later on. So the importance of data collecting is, 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 is very significant for us. If we are trying to uh, make the climate archive talk to the documentary archive, and I mentioned the ACRE project, which is the atmospheric circulation reconstructions of the Earth, uh, which is a project set up by the Met Office, and the sort of data they are collecting, which is uh, daily, sub daily mean from ships' logs. And they've collected, for example, 900 ship logs books from 1788 to 1834. And this is sort of rich data that I think is very useful for us. The paleo sources that we've been collecting again is from mainly from secondary paleo archives uh, to, lo to, to looking at lake core material, and that uh, feeds again into our uh, natural archive data collection uh, and has helped foment some very interesting material uh, for uh, especially for our collaborators who are working on the science side. Uh, with regard to the documentary sources, again, we have tried to refine the stuff that we look at uh, in terms of Mughal records, uh, VOC documents, EIC records, uh, trying to look, for example, and trying to create a timeline of events uh, for the 17th century. And here, for example, you can see uh, 1589 heavy floods in Ujjain and Malva. 1592 epidemic outbreak of colors are uh, the sources also delineated. Um, and so on. And we are trying to make sure sources that we have are, um, uh, are refined and are uh, adequate to understand what is happening in the spirit. So the point about mapping climate and weather, climate and weather are very complex um, and both can vary temporally and spatially in their influences and impacts. Therefore, um, to collect useful data, you need good data courage. So how do you map this? information and you for in order to map this you need lots of observation and an inform information and an information flow network the world's biggest weather phenomena are the monsoon system the seasons and enso as we know and the importance of um, uh, south asia for global climate deb debates is one thing that i want to emphasize here through the emergence of colonial meteorological networks because the british empire offered a sort of vantage point to collect uh, uh, data on climate from a from a series of uh, very very interesting data points that they uh, collected and mapped so you understand the south asia helps you to understand uh, climate mechanisms and in fact in fact the importance of south asia for global climate debates is only beginning to be understood now it also helps your empire also helps you to map teleconnections between say australia india uh, South Africa, uh, St. Helena, the Cape, and so on, as Richard Grove's work so admirably pointed out. Now, the importance of empire data, um, and it helps challenge, for example, Eurocentrism in terms of global climate debates. Uh, and feeding this data into global climate debates, I think, is becoming extremely important. So what our project is trying to emphasize and underline is the importance of India and the Indian Ocean world for global climate. 
So one thing that is uh, significant for us when we look at it, the Indian um, cl climate is the word is of course the word monsoon. Uh, monsoon from the Arabic mosum, a season. <clears throat> and I said, as I said, a key to understanding world climate was understanding the monsoon. So the Indian Peninsula was uh, extremely important to understanding world climate. And this was recognized between um, quite early, between 1700 and 1924, by Indian civil servants mainly, both British and Indian, uh, Scots, German, and Bengali, for example, who tried to map uh, the monsoon and tried to understand how the monsoon affected both uh, world climate, ocean temperatures affecting the monsoon and so on. And they studied it through uh, a network that they built up. Uh, and uh, contributions to this network were made by the rest of the British Empire and by other colonial empires. Um, so the emergence of colonial meteorological networks, I think, is um, particularly critical and important here. Uh, and here you can, you can see um, uh, Bradley's um, uh, uh, um, measurements here. Which, which equate very much to very modern sorts of measurements on temperature and pressure data. <clears throat> and much of it, I think, of the colonial mapping is very useful for us today when we look at uh, trying to document uh, uh, climate and weather. So the stages of this information network are um, quite interesting as well. Missionary networks, the Moravian missionaries, Danish and German networks um, are equally important. For example, um, missionary activity in Protestant Halle um, was the first to pioneer natural history observation. Uh, plus, we have data, as I said, from East India Company ships. And all of them measured, for example, cyclone, drought frequency, grain supply. And this data, I think, is extremely useful for us. In Madras, um, Geisler measured cyclones. In fact, the term cyclonology emerges um, in the 19th century as a result of some of the uh, activities of these networks. Information um, also came from Moluccas and Trankobar. Um, so Danish, uh, Trankobar, as we know, is a Danish colony. So German missionaries were also involved in the data collection. But one network I'd really like uh, to refer you to is William Roxburgh, who became the director of the Calcutta Botanic Garden in the 1780s, who understood uh, for the first time these linkages in climate between India and the rest of the world. And I think Roxburgh is a very, very intro interesting um, character, someone that uh, both Rob Allen, who, who I collaborate with at the, at the UK Met Office, has, has written quite extensively on Roxburgh's Madras meteorological diary, which he kept in 1787, and helps us record the typhoon in Madras in 1780s. So Roxburgh can be seen as the first climatologist or climate historian, and he recognized the crisis of the 1790s. Now we know um, that's been caused by a weather phenomenon um, uh, of the warming of the oceans, uh, the El Nino. And he also, for example, uh, mapped the history of droughts. So this character uh, is quite an important and significant character, and, and he um, is in some in some senses a one man band who creates a network um, of understanding about uh, 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 South Asia and the importance of South Asia for global for understanding global climate. So the observation network um, of, uh, that he, for example, inaugurated uh, spanned empire. The, it, it started with the Botanic Garden observations in Calcutta and Madras. He gave weather a long-term perspective. Um, he linked up with other people, such as Alexander Beetson in St. Helena. And some of the important um, stuff that was produced at this time was Roxburgh's uh, India records of all India drought in 1791. Um, the, 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 there was uh, another publication on drought in St. Helena and drought uh, in the Caribbean in Montserrat. Uh, in, in, his, in 1816, um, it was recognized uh, that there was a global drought. Um, the, uh, and this, this, I think, is quite significant. The global uh, links, I think, are quite interesting. So the first scientist to recognize the global nature of climate, though, uh, was uh, was even earlier, though, Edmund Halley, who thought globally in 1676, uh, and he estimated the amount of salt, uh, when he estimated the amount of salt in the world oceans. 
Um, other global links were by Henry Piddington, who uh, between 1798 and 1852, who collected information on cyclones, uh, and Charles Mel Meldrum, who started off as the main player in the Met Office. So all these characters, I think, are interesting when we look at this empire-wide um, network. Um, and here are some of the characters spanning um, the two centuries, William Roxburgh in the 18th century, Henry Blandford uh, in the 19th century, Charles Stodd, and of course, Gilbert Walker, uh, who discovered Walker's circulation. So this link between Australian and Indian meteorologists or teleconnections in terms of understanding global drought events, I think are quite interesting and important for understanding world climate. So by 1852, you had 123 weather stations in India. The center of calculation was at Calcutta, very interestingly, then to be noted. Uh, the Himalayan data was collected by the Strachey and Shalak White brothers. Um, the Indian uh, Maharajas were not to be left far behind. In 1836, the Raja of Travancore appointed a meteorologist. And in 1846, the Madras government started a Neil Giri observatory. Um, systema systematized weather data collection was uh, collected between 1848 and 1867. And these are, this, of course, is the uh, provides the <clears throat> instrumental record for a lot of the modeling that now gets done. And But what we are also looking co to collect is the pre-instrumental sort of data. 1865 to 1869, the telegraph was used to transfer marine data and regional data to predict weather and cyclones especially. By 1871, weather instruments were standardized empire-wide. Uh, by 1877, William Hunter connected droughts to sunspots, interestingly. In 1878, the first photos of the sun were taken by Captain John Waterhouse. By 1877, the Indian Met Office was established, which made links with Australia. So this brings me to the discovery of ENSO and um, how some of the data that was collected uh, in this uh, period of empire data collection also links up with a more modern understanding of how um, the El Nino Southern Oscillation or the, or the warming and the cooling of the oceans operates. And here, of course, many of us might be familiar with ENSO. Um, it operates in two distinct phases, alternating over a period of roughly two to seven years. Um, people, uh, you know, what mainly what scientists are saying is that ENSO, uh, the number of ENSO years are intensifying as we are getting uh, global warming. Um, so th the, the links between ENSO and global warming, I think, are quite interesting and important. Uh, the phases of ENSO are characterized by warming in the tropical Pacific and the Indian Ocean, uh, which often suppresses rainfall in the Western Pacific in the case of El Nino, and converse in the case of La Nina, where you get more rainfall. So there's ENSO and La Nina events. Um, uh, El Nino and La Nina events, I think, are quite interesting. But one thing we need to note is that ENSO can vary in its matter of expression and center of actions. Um, but ENSO events are typically accompanied by extreme weather events. Uh, the other point I'd like to make is the links between El Nino and the South Asian monsoon. Uh, the structure of sea surface temperatures in the Indian Ocean is linked to more familiar patterns of uh, sea surface temperatures in the Pacific Ocean, though most recent activity um, research suggests by the Indian Met Office that the Indian Ocean is warming considerably. And they put down the recent cyclonic event of the Amphan cyclone, which was a level five uh, cyclone, to the warming up uh, of the Indian Ocean due to um, global warming. So uh, ENSO is something that is quite important. But what we are trying to do is to see whether uh, the earlier climate data recorded by these uh, meteorologists was actually mapping what we think of today as ENSO events. Um, so uh, the ENSO, this ENSO example, for example, um, details the resolution of both El Nino and La Nina, which is protract, what is known as protracted episodes, uh, which is defined as a period of two years or more when measures of the phenomena in various precipitation extremes um, uh, are, are intensified in, and, 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 and in an ENSO sensitive region. And this particular time series of the reconstructed uh, South Asian summer monsoon index, uh, which is using both Speleotherm natural archives from a series of um, caves, um, maps onto much of the famine events that are recorded in the documentary archive. And I think this is very interesting. 
The authors of the South Asian Monsoon Index note that it captures 18 out of the 26 recorded famine events, though it's still falling short. Um, uh, and that uh, notably 11 of the 16 short events with duration of one to three years are accurately depicted in the reconstruction. I think this is quite interesting. And the more we refine uh, our documentary record, the more uh, the Spielotham data for, and now I think there is um, a cave in Cherapunji that they are collecting very, very, very good resolution Spielotham data and mapping that in, uh, onto the documentary sort of archives that, that are being collected, for example, by Sussex. Uh, I've just had a recent interaction with saying that it really maps absolutely beautifully to the Spielotham record, which is very, very exciting for us right now. And we are sort of collaborating with a American team on this work currently. So these are the decadal uh, trends of reconstructed El Nino and La Nina events. If you look at 1790s, which we are quite interested in, you can see there were strong El Ninos in the 1790s. Um, and this is very useful for us uh, when we are trying to understand what impact that had, for example, uh, in India, uh, when, for example, when Ros Roxborough was keeping his Madras meteorological diary, was there, for example, uh, uh, a La Nina, El Nino sort of event at this time. And certainly the El Nino, La Nina record tells us that there was uh, quite a strong uh, El Nino. So some of the, for the 17th century, some of the El Nino episodes have been mapped here, 1659 to 1661. 1650 to 1652, 1618 to 1621, 1607, 1609. And the La Nina episodes are in blue, 1637 to 39, uh, 1622 to 32, 1600 to 1605. Um, uh, this particular slide um, is showing you how the, the delayed nature of the monsoon um, uh, that is being mapped uh, uh, through the diary of a Bombay governor. And this is the work of um, Adamson and Nash in 2013, showing you how uh, you know you, even just simple weather memoirs can allow you to build a, a a scale of how the rainfall was sort of delayed in Bombay, uh, uh, successively delayed over the years uh, as a result of um, the delayed arrival of the monsoon, and that is very carefully mapped through uh, a diary kept by the local governor of Bombay. Other material that we've looked at is the Palmer um, Drought Severity Index uh, maps of the uh, monsoon uh, atlas of Asia. And here you can see for the Bengal famine um, that it, it was not, it, there was drought, but not such a severe drought. Uh, the, more dr the more important drought events seem to be in 1876 and 1878, the period of the Victorian drought. Um, 18, 1756 to 1768. So how do it's very interesting. How do we account for the 10 million who died in the uh, Bengal famine of 1770, uh, which wasn't really such a seriously uh, such a serious drought event? So again, uh, interesting questions about uh, whether it was a political caused by political or economic reasons rather than climate reasons if we if we merge these archives and we can ask some very very interesting questions <clears throat> so for the 17th century when we when we look at the text of um, um uh, jeffrey parker he talks about this whole idea of a general crisis and he talks about the little ice age which is this uh, fundamental notion of a crisis for 17th century Europe. And what he's interested in is whether this notion of crisis, uh, which happens in Europe in the 17th century, which he links very clearly to the downturn in global temperatures, which became known as the Little Ice Age, does how does that translate if we look at South Asia? Uh, and we then uh, took up this challenge. He seems to suggest that South Asia was equally affected. And we looked at some of the data uh, for the 17th century, and we saw that it did have some of the weakest period of monsoons on record for that period. Um, the ENSO example also um, showed some protracted episodes of ENSO. Uh, in the 17th century, ENSO events seem to occur every 2.5 years, half the five-year average. So was there really a, a problem with climate uh, in the 17th century in India? And, and the problem uh, we found that was uh, Jeffrey Parker's argument of the Little Ice Age um, combined uh, lots of very different things. So 
cooler temperatures and later climate variability in the 17th century was put down to reduce solar energy, increase volcanic activity, and the increasing frequency of El Nino. So it is just one of the El Nino being only one of the other two events. <coughs> and the years of the, uh, um, the Little Ice Age coincided very well with the Mughal Empire uh, and uh, some of the crises of the Mughal Empire. So this was there was, this was a period of severe political depression in the middle middle mid 17th century. So the documentary record argued. Um, and um, um, uh, for Parker, the Mughal Empire can be seen as having come close to a revolution in the 1650s, uh, while the 17th century as a whole was a period in which wars were fought almost continuously. Droughts, floods, and famines, particularly in the late 1620s and early 1630s in Gujarat and the Deccan, were cited as examples of this upheaval. And uh, so uh, if you look at Western uh, travelers records like William Forster's, um, he recorded, for example, in South India, in Nagapatnam, that half the people of the area were dead and the stench of the dead and the dying was terrifying. So on the face of it, Parker's emphasis of climate drivers in the spirit of Mughal history appears justified in contemporary des descriptions. But the usefulness of these descriptions without uh, supporting statistical or demographic data or at least estimates of numbers of people affected is questionable. Uh, furthermore, the reliability of, in particular, European descriptions has been strongly questioned uh, by work on the development of tropes and famine reporting of the spirit. So there is a critique here of Parker's claim of exceptional violence in the 17th century from other historiographical sources. For example, John F. Richards and, of course, the esteemed Irfan B have described the 17th century as a period of relative calm and stability. That Parker can point to a near continuous warfare is not in itself proof of the exceptionalism of the 17th century, I could argue. Um, so there is a kind of, the jury is out whether the 17th century in India was a period of crisis. For um, historians like uh, Kling, Smith, and Jeffrey Williamson, it was the 18th century which witnessed the most significant upheavals in India's economic and political structure with the dissolution of the Mughal Empire and uh, the regrouping and the forced and their forced regrouping of states under the East India Company. So um, the question then for us is, was the 18th century worse? In which case, the whole Parker argument <coughs> is, is questionable. And if you look at the 18th century then, um, uh, from uh, from 16, 1765, when the British um, uh, took over Bengal to 1858, the long 18th century, to the mid-19th uh, mid century, you get 12 famines and four severe scarcities. And the reasons are not far to see. Many Indian communities were disturbed by the interventions of the East India Company, the revenue and agricultural regimes of taxation, encourage, which encouraged sedentarization, raids, uh, the re restriction of raids, hunting, and nomadism. So traditional lifestyles being restricted. Um, for example, in, er in places that I've looked at in Kutch and the Sundarbans, uh, areas which were uh, which were uh, resilient at one time, where where, where you had pastoralists and nomad nomadic herdsmen, made um, more legible uh, legible in economic terms and settled in environmental terms uh, to aid taxation. <clears throat> so the East India Company's um, uh, settlement policy did result in um, uh, scarcity and in famine. And in, for example, uh, in the 1770s, uh, one com commentator noted uh, that uh, the late famine in Bengal and the loss of 3 million inhabitants was uh, due to that famine, uh, due to the settlement policy of the EIC. To summarize then, um, uh, it... It, it's the uh, cultural, social, political, and economic factors uh, which loom large in the causality of the 1770 famine. Uh, so though the winter uh, of 1772 was perhaps um, unusually severe, climate appears to have played a relatively insignificant role in the development of what remains one of more, India's most disastrous and costly famines um, uh, in, in the 18th century. So there, I think you can say that climate was not so much uh, a factor. <clears throat> um, and some of the sources that talk about this is Dan versus A Century of Famine, uh, which is um, an important source, not just on meteorology and on famine, but allows us to place climate and particularly rainfall variation within a larger causal framework. And Dan was stated quite uh, interestingly that famine is, famines in India have risen from several different causes, 
the most general cause has been the failure of the rains. So this uh, was the famine map of India uh, in the 1790s. And we look at the teleconnections um, between India and say Australia and so on at this period. And we've done, I've done a paper on this. We get some very, very interesting uh, data. For example, <clears throat> here in the 1780s, um, if you move to the period uh, of the 1780s, upper parts of Hindustan. So we are leaving now the 1770 famine. We are moving to the 1780s, which is uh, seen to be a period of um, El Nino related events uh, from the El Nino database that we have. 1780s seems to be a period of uh, abnormal cessation of rain and extreme drought um, in, uh, in uh, Western India and in Lahore, in, in Bihar, in Delhi. Northward uh, in Calcutta, the crops in the ground had been scorched and nearly destroyed. <clears throat> and the long drought was succeeded by great floods. And this is Danvers is sort of um, a century later when he's recording what happened in, this, uh, in 1783 in uh, Eastern India. Similarly, what's happening in Australia is also quite interesting that we get a lot of detail on the settlement of Australia. This time we get the uh, records of inclement, inclement tempestuous weather in 1788, making life in the new colony difficult. <clears throat> Here you have um, the heavy rainfall uh, 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 creating, for example, um, uh, damage to property. The roads about the settlement were rendered impossible, and some huts were injured um, uh, when needed to be repaired. In Africa as well, uh, you get, uh, again, unsettled weather a preponderance of drought here. So you get drought, you get heavy rain, you get drought. So it seems to be um, um, uh, uh, there was an unusual forcing of conditions in the 1780s. So uh, well, uh, looking at teleconnections, I think is very, very interesting and important to see uh, how globally climate was operating in different periods. And the archival record helps you to map this global climate uh, signature. And here, uh, South Asian droughts uh, and floods of the 1780s is more detailed map. Uh, here, Gerges and Fowler have talked about this El Nino event, a protracted El Nino, La Nina event. Of course, as we know in the documentary record, is there's, there's a Chalisa famine of 1783 and 84, um, and Grove has written about it. Uh, and um, once the famine was over, there was l great floods. So what it is is a protracted El Nino. So you have a drought event followed by a flood event, uh, which is a La Nina event. And in 1787, you get the typhoon in Bengal, uh, which was recorded uh, by uh, Roxburgh in his Madras Meteorological Diary, uh, when a cyclone in the Bay of Bengal struck the east coast near Karinga in Andhra Pradesh, resulting in 20,000 deaths. And that's the Madras uh, mean pressure that's been recorded at that time. <laughs> I won't go through this uh, particular slide, just to say that the 1787 typhoon is very well recorded in the general letter from India from 15 December. Um, a series of colonial records, for example, Campbell records uh, notes the scarcity of grain uh, following the uh, severe storms and the repeated inundations. So um, our work with Rob Allen suggests that this as was a very period of extended and so so it maps the uh, unsettled climate that we've just described. Uh, one of the aims of the, our research was to identify previously undescribed wet and dry periods in the pre-1900 uh, instrumental period and examine possible relationships with the ENSO phenomenon. And this we were able to do quite conclusively, I think, for the 1790s. <clears throat> so I think this is a very important um, um, uh, achievement for us. Uh, in terms of uh, analyzing how uh, the impact on India resulted, of this El Nino resulted in some very unsettled condi conditions. So in order, so what does this all mean for um, current understanding um, cyclones? Um, the recent work has argued that stronger and more frequent cyclones are likely to occur if current trends in climate change continue. Um, and uh, there's a sense in which um, uh, uh, there's a, there's a, it's argued that there's a 10 to 40% increase in the frequency of uh, tropical cyclones. 
and that each cyclone may be, and each storm may be 45% more powerful. Um, this is Gary Manuel's work, uh, and he is uh, his work is based on six computer models, which uses weather data and historical records um, simulated, uh, which simulated 600 annual storms from 1950 to 2005. And I think, um, in some senses, going further back, and that's what we've tried to do with our data set, looking at 19th century cyclones, allows us to understand the frequency of cyclones in the Indian Ocean region much more. And given the impact of the Amphan cyclone, I think this, is, this work is uh, extremely prescient and extremely important. And we can also look, for example, at the way in which um, El Nino and the Enso phenomenon might impinge on tropical cyclone uh, and characteristics. So it's very useful to gather more documentary data on ENSO-related events, including tropical cyclones and their impact in South Asia in the 18th and 19th century. And once again, the importance of colonial collections is, is here. <clears throat> and why and how, when we collect um, some, of these, uh, some of this data on cyclones and, um, and other natural disasters, and here is the 1819 um, Kachi earthquake, we are also able to qualitatively collect responses from communities. and. Uh, and this is, again, useful uh, for adaptation and resilience lessons that we can learn, uh, how communities, um, especially from below, have uh, adapted to what are known as um, what they see as natural disasters, and how the intensification of these disasters leads to uncertainty of a very different sort of kind. And that, again, you can map through the anthropological record and the ethnographic record, which is what we are also trying to do. For example, in these traditional grasslands, which was um, destroyed by the uh, creation of the Allah Band in 1819, uh, the migration of nomadic pastoralists and the bunny, the Ravaris and so on, um, uh, uh, was, uh, was one form of response. Response was no longer possible um, through, through various, uh, through various uh, th uh, events that have happened, including the partition of India and the destruction of a pastoral way of life through sedentarization. And we can come to those points if necessary in the question answer session. Similarly, the cyclone data allows us also to understand both the impact of cyclone uh, mapping and the effect of cyclone mapping and the responses of communities. If you look at the history of cyclones in Eastern India um, and this particular Granges, Brahmaputra, Meghna, Delta, um, uh, the collecting data on historical cyclones is, uh, is very important for climate security and for settlement research. For example, the historic patterns of settlement in the Delta area of Sundarbans, where particular islands were left unoccupied but are now uh, uh, over, over, over time have been occupied, resulting in, uh, in flooding and a destruction of, uh, of lifestyles. And certainly, um, in terms of Calcutta and South Asian cities like Bombay and Calcutta, the impact of uh, climate change um, uh, and mapping of uh, events in the past will be very interesting. Uh, again, useful for us to understand um, how historically environmental change, large-scale reclamation, poor drainage has impacted on this area uh, over, over the time frame that we are looking at. Um, especially uh, when we look at the, the impact of uh, uh, Amphan, the Amphan cyclone. And here again, uh, the law of storms, we've got exceedingly good uh, data by collected by Henry Piddington, who collected information on cyclones in India, the Sailor's Handbook for the law of storms, and there's Piddington himself in a punch cartoon. Charles Medrum, who I mentioned in 1860s, who started off as a main player in the Met Office, also collected climate data of the Indian Ocean. He is responsible for uh, developing the term cyclonology. And I think uh, his, he used ship's logs to get a very impressive amount of data on, on, on the southern Indian Ocean and on um, the path of cyclones. And this, interestingly, is some images that we get uh, from the colonial archive of the 1864 cyclone, which was also quite a serious cyclone, which destroyed one third of Calcutta and uh, caused the death of 48,000 people. The recent Amphan cyclone hasn't had such a destructive effect on life, and that's because of the responses. But uh, this, this cyclone data that exists in Piddington and Blandford's archive, I think, is very, very significant for us if we are going to be mapping the impact of cyclones and the, and the effect of um, uh, climate change on cities, for example, in Calcutta and Bombay. Um, so this is the inundation map of the Calcutta cyclone of 1864. 
The storm at a width of 100 miles has proceeded. Um, it had 10 miles an hour. Its greatest damage on land was from a 15-foot storm surge. And again, it would be very interesting to, to look at these bookend events, the 1864 cyclone and the cyclone uh, that happened last month to see what the inundation map of Calcutta looked like. Um, 48,000 people were declared dead in Calcutta, so one third of the population seems to have passed away. Um, and the official report um, by Blanford uh, is a biography of the cyclone. Um, and the origins of the cyclone are mapped very, in a very detailed fashion, where it rose, how it sort of emerged, which bit of uh, the the uh, the the way in which it moved is all very it's very the Henry Blanford's origin of a cyclone really maps the cyclone very very carefully and the developments um, in colonial meteorology helped to uh, understand the nature of this cyclone and here are some images um, uh, of what happened uh, there was a ship blown into the Calcutta Botanic Garden uh, again much of these areas will be figuring in the current cyclone as well and the contemporary reports here are also very very detailed um as measured by mr whittle the height of the storm wave at diamond harbor was 4.58 feet over the top of the bund <clears throat> and then you, you can get the destruction immense many of the villages close by were swept away particular areas were affected um uh, and so on and then and, and uh, Detailed quotations from eyewitness accounts are being used uh, to see uh, how which areas were affected. Uh, uh, here, are the result of the casualties: 102 Paka houses were destroyed, with 563 severely damaged. 40,000 native huts were completely leveled, and that's the that's the detail of those who died in the surrounding areas. The uh, ship logs are also very important. This is Clarence, uh, survived the cyclone, where James Watson gave a detailed record of the storm with hourly readings of wind and barometer. This again is um, the buildings that were affected in central Cal Calcutta. Um, uh, and I think it's very interesting. One interesting thing that developed was the uh, and Blanford had um, and Piddington had both warned against this. This was the creation of Port Canning. Um, uh, after the after the cyclone of 1864, they had been warned uh, that do not create Port Canning, but Port Canning was created. It tells you about the hubris of states and governments. Um, and of course, Port Canning was destroyed, and the second cyclone wiped out Port Canning. So all that investment um, was lost. So another cyclone which has been mapped very beautifully in this book by Benjamin Kingsbury is the cyclone of 1876, uh, where 10,000 people have died following um, a cholera epidemic and the famine that followed. Um, and here, Kingsbury turns the interpretation on its head, showing that the cyclone of 1876 was not simply a natural event, but shaped by um, exploitation and inequality um, in Bengali society. And this, of course, is something that uh, we have uh, talked about a lot. So failure to remit taxation, the salt tax of 650%, the ruthless laser fare policy of Richard Temple and the Temple wage, the poor um, relief efforts. So the dead and dying numbering about 215,000 um, in the 1876 cyclone, uh, including 100,000 dead by cholera. So you know, the question that I asked, are cyclones intensifying? Um, some experts believe they are. Others experts suggest that we cannot yet detect any increase in the frequency of intensity of tropical cyclones. But of course, we've had this um, fun, uh, you know, four, uh, you know, level four, level five cyclone that hit India on 20th of May. It's only by improving uh, the historical weather and climate database can we provide a platform with which to address such key concerns. Um, on climate change. The impact of extreme events, as I said, will be enormous um, in South Asia because of the population densities involved. Um, so in, in order to conclude then, the scope of historical data uh, to refine climate anomalies is underestimated. Large amounts um, remain untapped. It, this is a data rescue effort that requires assiduous um, a mining of the historical archive. And, and, and this uh, data uh, uh, can be improved, dramatically improved, or data paucity or data poverty can be improved uh, both through time and wider in space. Um, 
So as extreme events increase, the predictability of these events becomes more important. Um, so improving the historical and climate database, as I said, will improve, will provide a platform with which to address key concerns in climate change. Uh, at the same time, we need to create an archive uh, that yields important data on climate adaptation and resilience. So I'll just end there. I'll stop sharing. Um, I think it's here. Sorry. So it's it's that uh, square square white square box on. Um, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. sorry. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Anita, thank you very much. That was fascinating. Um, it made me think many things. Um, I really like the idea of thinking through about history, through climate and the ways in which you brought such disparate sources together um, in this, this archive retrieval project as well, which also spoke to political economy questions of the time. I have one observation and a, and a larger question, if I may, to open up the discussion. Um, you said in relation to the 18 earthquake in Kutch, which is something I have spent some time thinking about, about how uh, Desi or vernacular sources talked about migration, uh, transhumans and pastoralism. But what to me is really interesting about that earthquake is it allowed the British to consolidate their political influence in the region. So it was really a confluence of natural disaster and political consolidation that seems to me to mark throughout history the conjunction of those two, two movements, a natural disaster or a, or a flood and a change political regime or form of governance. So I wonder if you could comment on that relationship and then secondly um this is this is a genuine question when you look back in history through these sources you can see cyclones and you can record their frequency and their occurrence but when you compare that to the to the present day you've got the climate data but how do you deal with as a, as a historian comparing things through time how do you deal with the changing political economy or regulatory regimes of disaster, such as improved food distribution systems that reduce the possibility of famine, or uh, early warning systems or flood defense systems that maybe invisibilize things that were in the past disasters? I'm sure you've thought about it, but the question is, what did you think about it? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And should I can I answer um, straight away or should I wait for? Yeah, no, I think uh, I think both very, very significant questions. Um, certainly for Kutch, um, one of the, the paper that we, we were just writing on Kutch is about making Kutch le legible, Kutch and the Sundarbans legible in terms of um, EIC and post EIC um, Raj practices. So one of the ways in which they were using that moment to sedentarize pastoralists, they were using that uh, the the period of the 19th century to uh, ensure that uh, you know uh, they were taxing as much as they could. Uh, they were um, the, the 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 traditional homelands of the uh, the traditional migratory routes of the uh, bunny herdsmen was something that they began to recognize as being important only later on. Of course, the, the whole bunny grasslands were later on, as we as we know, destroyed by um, Prospera and all sorts of invasive species of plants. But that was much more a 20th century Indian government, complete lack of understanding of pastoralism. But that, you know, uh, came alongside, as I said, the partition, the breakdown of migratory routes. But if you look at the way in which they saw Kutch, they saw Kutch as a landscape which was harsh, which had brackish water, which needed irrigation, which, but while at the same time downgrading traditional modes of living in in those grasslands uh, and inhabiting those areas so these were areas which were made as rohan d'souza would say uh, much more uh, vulnerable 
through colonial practices. So I would totally agree with, with, with that. And so similarly with the settlement practices in Sundarbans, where areas which historically should not have been reclaimed were reclaimed <clears throat> and islands which should not have been settled were settled in the interests of um, taxation. But at the same time, also colonial policy had some very important um, positive features. For example, in Kulna, which was prevented, uh, which was protected by the from the cyclone recently, was an area which had a very high area of reserve forest, which the British put into place, precisely as a result of the activities of Richard Temple, the horrible man we encountered in the context of the 1876 um, cyclone in Calcutta, who said, "No, no, we need to keep those forests." In the Sundarbans. So those are the forests that have protected Kulna today uh, in the face of the Amphan cyclone. Yeah? So it's uh, colonial practices are very, very interesting, as are governance uh, and state practices um, in the more contemporary period and how they respond to crises. Um, either they respond to it in a more sophisticated, nuanced way. And I think the British try to do both uh, somewhat unwittingly and were successful, certainly in terms of. Uh, um, restoring mangrove forests uh, in, uh, in, in Sundarbans. As a result, uh, your, your second question about early warning system, certainly again, if you look, I, I don't know, I haven't mapped the inundation map of uh, the Amphan cyclone. You know, you only had 118 people who died in the region, right? So if 48,000 people died in 1864, so clearly those early warning systems have worked, they've moved people out, um, damage to buildings, of course, uh, and so on. But again, there's the hubris of the nation state as well. You know, building where they shouldn't be building. The Port Canning was um, something that the 1867 cyclone wiped out. It'd be interesting to see what was wiped out now, you know. Uh, so I think, I think, uh, yes, you know, Amitabh Ghosh talks about, again about the hubris of states where earlier port cities were built in much more shaded in areas, you know. Uh, where you didn't get these effects of these uh, extreme events, but now the more modern port cities are built flagrantly on 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 coasts, which uh, get you know attacked you know by by these extreme events. So I think the hubris of mod the modern nation state in the context of climate change and the impact of climate change on cities is something that we can really address. Yeah. Thank you. So, Neil, how should we work the questions? Shall I read them or will you solicit them? OK, I will read them. We have one from uh, Aditya Ramesh, who says, hi, we need to two questions. First, you've used the term climate change and environment and have written about the Anthropocene. How do you see these as things as different or as overlapping forms of analysis or analytics? And the second question is, uh, following on from mine, how do we marry social history, for instance, of property, mercantilism, deforestation and infrastructure with these long durée kinds of histories? Nice questions. Thanks, Aditya. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Aditya. Yeah. So climate change, um, I mean, uh, again, this is something that I, I, I'm led by the, the interdisciplinary team that I work with. Um, in terms of um, sea surface temperatures in the Indian Ocean and El Nino related events, um, there seems to be a consensus that global warming is causing the rise of SSTs in the Indian Ocean, right? Uh, and that the more frequency of, um, of uh, cyclones could be related to that according to some of the work that's being done now. Now that could be a, a climate change sort of uh, effect of uh, of uh, of uh, when we look at particular events such as uh, cyclones. In terms of El Nino and La Nina events, again the frequency of El Nino and La Nina events, I believe, is linked to global warming again, and linked to um, uh, climate change. So once again, uh, and this is I'm not an expert here. I would be. Um, again uh, looking at my uh, collaborators who work on this to you in, in terms of using that in terms of using the term anthropocene i've used the term in the past you're absolutely right um but that has much more to do with anthropo uh, you know anthropogenic um uh, uh climate change or a change which has been caused as a result of more carbon in the atmosphere and there the dating of 1610 i think is very exciting 
when you look at the way in which um, uh, there was a whole spike uh, uh, in carbon stock as a result of uh, the destruction of uh, or the death of Indians um, following war, uh, following disease uh, in the Americas. And that, of course, again, I, I mean, that data is now being, uh, uh, there are some critiques of that. But 1610 is seen to be a period when you do get anthropogenic uh, climate change and a rise in carbon stock. So in that sense, uh, that's, the, that's the sense I use um, the term Anthropocene. Uh, in terms of uh, social history, uh, how does that link to the longer durée climate history? Again, um, uh, uh, Oh, this is as good. The social history dimension is only as good as the documentary archives that you harvest. Um, I've been contacted by this American team who are very interested in the speleothem record that they are getting for 1345 uh, from uh, from um, uh, India in terms of the Chalisa famines uh, and so on. And uh, they have they're getting a very very good resolution, and they wanted to know what the what the tug, the archives of Feroz Shah Tughlaq was, was yielding. And this is something that we are sort of engaged in, in looking at uh, the activities of Feroz Shah Tughlaq in terms of um, irrigation and so on in that context. Uh, so I think it's again as to, uh, the, the social history needs to map onto uh, the, the history of climate, but that depends on the, the documentary archive, the richness of the archive, uh, and the historian who's uh, looking for those sources. I don't know whether that answers your question, Aditya. Aditya, you could type. You could type an answer. <laughs> okay, so we have a, a question from uh, Meghna Mehta. Uh, I don't know if you know Meghna, Anita, but she also works in the Sundarbans. And the question is in two parts. It's a, it's a first stab at the question, then it's a refinement of the question. And the refinement makes a lot of sense. So I, I'll just read it. Um, my question is, how do we work with the particular landscapes too, not just weather and climate? For example, the uniqueness of a shifting delta. This question of reclaiming is slightly problematic because today lots of conservative economists of conservation want a planned retreat, in inverted commas, of about two and a half million people. And this is problematic because even Calcutta was itself a marsh. So what about thinking of shifting villages, markets, and settlements, instead of the idea of fixity. And then the clarification comes, fixity seemed like a colonial project. So now after the cyclone, the recent cyclone, all the concrete embankments have broken. And so perhaps we can think about settlements that are nomadic and people who move with shifting waters. The mangrove forest is indeed a river and new land formations are constantly forming as some are breaking with shifting chars or sandbags. End of quote. What is it about the Sundarbans that inspires people to write so poetically? Ed asked. <laughs> no, I think that's a brilliant question. I think this whole uh, idea of island hopping um, char people, you know, is, is, is true for the Sundarbans. But if you look at the longer durée history of the Sundarbans, and I'm no expert on the Sundarbans, uh, this is uh, only marginal to my uh, area of research, but if you look at the uh, documentary archive, once again, what you're getting is what uh, Meghna is saying, that there there is a sense in which there uh, there is a sense in which um, the land uh, plans for the Sundarbans, for example, Schiller's uh, plan in the you uh, know in the latter half of the 19th century early part of the 20th century is all about fixing um, uh, these mm -hmm. lands getting getting more investors in uh, trying to settle particular uh, uh, particular lands and forget about the uh, the island hopping um, char people so that fixity is again similar to what happens in Kutch where the colonial state is embarking on a taxation and settlement policy through primarily embankments. Um, what happens in terms of the long-term history of the Sundarbans then is, again, uh, it's made much more flood vulnerable, if you use, again, Rowan D'Souza's sort of terminology. Uh, you get much more settlement, again, as a result of the... The impetus of settlement, again, is um, is due to um, the partition again, 
del uh, you know the delta itself uh, you know uh, steers very clear of these forced uh, settlement patterns and, and and reacts you know and where and if you look at the indian side of the sundarbans versus the bangladesh side it's quite clear that the indian side has suffered a lot more soil erosion has suffered a lot more flooding and the Bangladesh side, interestingly, much more forested. And that, again, as I said, goes back to some of the forest reservation policies of the British. So uh, in answer to your question, um, yeah, I would agree with, with uh, you know, this is a region that has been made much more flood vulnerable. And whether you need to resettle these, these people, that, again, is a question that, um, you know, once you destroy a delta landscape, uh, how do you sort of continue living on it? How do you reclaim, uh, you know, the, the pastoralist way of life in Kutch or the char, uh, the island hopping ways of the char people, you know, um, uh, once there is a very different way of life being imposed uh, in this region? You know. It's a question that, you know, uh, I think a, a detailed land use survey of how these islands were mapped, why, why the why particular islands are being settled uh, as opposed to the higher level islands. Now the lower level islands are also being settled, you know, that sort of thing. When the settlement patterns occur? And a de detailed land use history of the Sundarbans, I think, is what is required. Brilliant. So one of the one of the features of hosting these things online is you can get some really rather pithy responses. So maybe yeah, no, absolutely true. From experts in their field, let me say, you know. So Megna responds to you saying um, maybe we could rethink fixity and property relations as we know them. A statement yeah. you'll never be allowed to make in a face-to-face -face seminar because yeah. we have too yeah. many questions, but maybe we could rethink fixity and property on that basis. Yeah. Right. There's a question from Soumya who says, yeah. Hi, Anita. Uh, were there any specific subaltern narratives that were either acknowledged in terms of ethnographic records <clears throat> to better understand climate history uh, in ways that are different from colonial climate scientists. Yeah, so there is a detailed archive which uh, we are trying to tap into and um, you can get that in the colonial record as well where they quote, for example, Bunny Herdman or where they, where they uh, quote the char communities about, uh, you know, how how uh, you can never be certain of anything um, uh, uh, now. I mean, the, about the changing levels of uncertainty, where earlier they were able to predict uncertainty and able to cater for uncertainty, the levels of uncertainty now are, my, are far out of, uh, of the bounds of their historical, oral, memory uh, and and lived uh, not forget about their lived experience even their uh, even in terms of the memorialized sort of landscape and that i think is quite new in terms of both the impacts of climate change or the impacts of new extreme events um and that is what you're seeing in a lot of the local older histories but certainly one thing we are trying to do is to, um, again, looking at these bookend, bookend events, 1819 Kachi earthquake, 2009 um, earthquake in Buj, <clears throat> where ethnographers have looked very de in detail. For example, Lila Mehta has looked at 2009, and she's taken a series of oral um, quotations and histories from these communities about the impact of the earthquake. And so those collect those narratives is also part of the project. Yeah, there is a very detailed history here to be uncovered. There, and that's a very good question, Samia. Thank you. Yeah. Brilliant. And then we have comments like, "Amazing, thanks, Vanita, and thank you!" Exclamation mark. Um, general signs of appreciation have appeared in the in the chat box. Um, there are no more questions, but if if you don't mind, I would like to ask one, and that's about. It's not so much about your methods as a historian, but it's it's a question about your methods as being a team player in an interdisciplinary research project. Mm. Say something about how <coughs> knowledge and power uh, come together in a project like that and how you manage to overcome disciplinary boundaries and conceptual languages to make sense of one another. 
Um, it's been a hard learning curve for me because I was, I, when I first was approached by a lot of these people, I thought, oh God, you know, what do they want expect me to do? I'm a mere historian, you know. Uh, so this whole idea that a, a speleotherm, a paleo person approaching me, uh, I would not be able to, um, to uh, do justice. But actually all they were interested in was the documentary record and to have access to a i mean which is again an expertise uh, so it was not about so much about what we could do for them but how how this changed the way we think about history itself so i was able then to work with them and 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 the i think the power relationship shifted you know it became uh, much more of a equal relationship where um, their work also infected my work. It became a it became a very very collaborative exercise, um, and I, I you know I, I, and it gave I mean for me I gave up my fear of you know of science as a, as a discipline which I could not engage with, and I suddenly realized that this was just a, a language you had to access and use and dismiss wherever it was appropriate, you know, and certainly. Um, that's that's the way in which I've looked at it, yeah. And dealing with scientists has been both informative and um, and um, a salutary lesson about how there are a lot of people out there who are doing some interesting work um, and would like to engage with us. Uh, and so the Anthropocene debate has been hijacked by scientists, and we really need to take this debate back. Um, humanities, uh, you know, it's about anthropogenic. It's about the philosophy of uh, and the way of life and the and the worldviews um, that we really need to think about and talk about. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, I'd like to thank you very much um, on behalf of SOAS and the South Asia Institute for coming to talk to us this afternoon. Um, I always find I, I gave a talk online last week, and you just get dumped unceremoniously out the other <laughs> end in a minute. So. Uh, I really heartily thank you and uh, for taking the talk to us and thank you for Sunil to uh, for organizing it. Oh, hang on. I've got there's, a, there's another comment from Megna. One moment. I know it's for me. OK. Um, so thanks very much. And don't take being dumped out of the other end of this meeting personally. It's just the way the technology works. And uh, on a personal note, I hope your husband comes home and he's fine later on today. Yeah, no, that was a bit boring, but thank you very much. It's great to meet you as well. And right. thank you okay. to various friends who are here, Aditya and, and Salmia and so on. Yeah, thank you.